supported the fact you called me valuable treasure because I want to send it to my children. <laughs> they don't always see, see me from that point of view. Uh, thank you for such a great welcome, Mark. Um, and thank you for welcoming a, a New Yorker here. And I just want to say from the outset, I'm not and never have been a New York Yankees fan. <laughs> so uh, when, when the, I'm a through and through Mets fan, so when the Twins come to the Bronx to play the Yankees, I'm on your side. <laughs> so don't worry. Um, you know, it's very, uh, it's really wonderful to, to be here in, in Minnesota, uh, to be in this house, and I also want to thank uh, the Minnesota Historical Society for, for welcoming us. Uh, I'm, as uh, Mark said, I, I also took a look, look at the, uh, the exhibits, which were really uh, both the current exhibits of people uh, from, uh, from Rotary and uh, from books from, from Af for Africa, but also all the, the rich historical uh, exhibits, which really are a credit to the wonderful history that binds uh, Minnesota with the United Nations. Um, as, as Mark said, I think from Harold Stassen, uh, St Stassen excuse me, to Hubert Humphrey, to Arvon Fraser, um, you've had leaders who fought for the United Nations and what it stands for. And thanks to the work of the UN Association, Global Minnesota, and Citizens for Global Solutions, I know you're also all training the next generation of leaders. And I had this afternoon the, the pleasure of going to speak to students at Highland Park High School. Uh, and had a couple of sessions there, answered their questions, had great conversations with them. So I think the future of Minnesota as an international powerhouse is in safe hands. But Minnesota has not only been a fertile land for great leaders, as Mark said, it's also the place where my former boss and someone very close to my heart, Kofi Annan, studied and truly learned to love and understand America and Americans. In fact, it was in Minnesota, he said, where he learned the negotiating skills that stayed with him throughout his life. But most important, Minnesota is the place where he learned to appreciate uh, and develop one of his most critical uh, diplomatic skills, how to understand the mindset of the person sitting across the negotiating table. Uh, Kofi often recounted that when he prepared to travel to McAllister, he knew of the cold climate and understand, understood the need for heavy jackets and sweaters, and so he packed accordingly. But however, he told himself that earmuffs were inelegant and beneath his dignity. <laughs> and that he said he would never use them. But I think, as he said, after one walk across campus where he nearly lost his ears, he went out and bought the biggest pair of earmuffs. <laughs> and as he later put it, don't walk into a situation and believe you know better than the natives. You better listen to them and watch what they do. And this is something he often told us uh, and we, we remember. I have the privilege of working in the glass tower that is the United Nations building in New York. And when you spend a lot of time there, as I have, there's always a risk of uh, sometimes forgetting who you are and what you're working for. You can become distracted by the day-to-day -day politics of the member states, and I think today more than ever, sidetracked by the bureaucracies, and sometimes you just get a little bit discouraged by the world around you. And that's why it's so important for me, and I do this on an annual basis, but for all of us who work at the United Nations, to go out and not only speak uh, to people, but I think more importantly, answer your questions, listen to your criticism, your, uh, your suggestions, maybe one or two compliments, and t taking the time, um, the, the work of the UN, let me put it this way, the work of the UN cannot be successful if we don't take the time to listen. And Kofi understood that and instilled those values in us and in me uh, in particular. Now, I've had the privilege of speaking at UNA chapters throughout the U.S., in Massachusetts, California, Oregon, Colorado, Washington State. I've even ventured deep into the heart of Texas and spoke in Houston and got out. And was, was, no, I, I joke. It was a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. Uh, and I've seen the impressive uh, work that UNA associations and their sister uh, organizations do at the grassroots level. Those efforts that you and your supporters make at the local level are critical to the work we do at the global level. You're that critical link that brings us closer to the first words of the UN Charter, we the peoples. You raise awareness in your communities, you engage with business, with students, local leaders, 
Some of you today, I think, may also have participated in the drafting of the Sustainable Development Goals. To put it simply, you help people understand the relevance of the United Nations, of their United Nations. Your efforts uh, and your work with elected representatives to ensure that there's continued and sustained American engagement at the United Nations are vital. This is especially true in the United States, where there remains misconceptions about the United Nations. Though recent polls show a high level of trust in the United Nations, and that is in no small part due to the work that you all do every day. So the most important thing I came here to do is to say thank you, and thank you for everything that you've been doing. I also want to talk a bit uh, about the Secretary General, about Antonio Guterres, how he sees the world uh, today, um, and also want to talk about the US-UN relationship and the value of the UN uh, to the United, States, the United States. So let's start with Antonio Guterres. He's my boss, he appointed me, he can fire me at any time, so I will try to be as honest and transparent as possible in describing his achievements. <laughs> <laughs> that, that being said, I, as, as Mark said, I've had the privilege, and privilege is a word I keep using because it really represents what I feel about the work that I get to do. I've worked for three secretaries general, all of them very different, uh, bring different experience, different backgrounds, but all have had shared a deep, deep uh, love for the United Nations and a belief in the ideals that are found in, in the Charter. Now, what sets Antonio Guterres apart from all of his uh, predecessors is his professional background. He's an engineer by training, but most importantly, a, polit a politician by profession, and I mean that in the best sense of the word. He spent more than 30 years in Parliament uh, in his native Portugal and almost nine years as Prime Minister in his country. And I think in the many years that I've worked at the UN, never have we needed a leader that has acute and very, very sharp political skills. Given the level of unpredictability that we face, irrationality and divisions within the membership, those political skills have been vital to the organization. Over the past two years, he's had to balance the needs, the very vocal positions of the member states and some of the most powerful member states. And so I, in my mind, he's a very successful to this moment tightrope walker. He's managed to keep his balance and to keep the UN whole, which is no small uh, accomplishment. So, you know, the Secretary General is often described uh, as the world's chief diplomat. But if you think about all the people that he deals with, all 193 of his interlocutors, all the heads of states and heads of government, they're all politicians. Mm -hmm. And they all have a foreign policy that is formed and shaped based on do uh, domestic political considerations. And that's true to varying degrees to every, for every one of them. And so to have a Secretary General who not only understands that link, but has experienced it, has been very, very important to us. So what motivates him? What is his agenda? What drives uh, Antonio Guterres? I think if you were to use one word, it would be prevention. Uh, prior to becoming Secretary General, as you know, he was High Commissioner for Refugees for a decade. He streamlined and revamped the work of the UN's refugee operation at a time of an exponential growth in the number of refugees that we saw in the world. So after 10 years of bringing humanitarian assistance to those in need, really a band-aid on their suffering due to conflict and, and wars that have driven them from their homes, He's placed prevention at the center of his agenda, so to orient the work of the UN today towards addressing the root causes of the problems he'd been facing as High Commissioner for Refugees. Our work today needs to be focused on preventing the situations that push people to move, that push people to board a, a dinghy to cross the Mediterranean with their children, knowing they have a 50-50 chance to actually make it across or to walk, uh, walk across the Sahel, or to try to cross to Rio Grande. What can we do to prevent those situations? And that is really at the heart of our work. Of course, investing in preventive diplomacy and to prevent conflict is an important part of prevention, but it's not its only aspect. Prevention is about addressing the root causes of conflict, 
whether between states or within a state, which is in fact the bulk of the conflicts that we see today. But it's also about investing in the implementation of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals agreed to by the Member States in 2015. They focus on every facet of development, improving governance, human rights, ensuring gender equality, mitigating climate change and global health, just to mention a few. It's all about investing in the betterment of human lives. And that is clearly a way to avoid conflict, to reduce human, forced human migration, and to avoid the breakdown of societies and increase and human suffering. Of those, the Secretary General has been particularly focused on climate change. Just recently in New York, he brought governments together, joined with civil society, business sector, to push for new and bold commitments to fight climate change. But most importantly, he brought young people into the tent. Greta Thunberg crossed the Atlantic at the invitation of the Secretary General to join him at the climate meeting. He organized a specific youth meeting just the day before uh, the big climate meeting to ensure that their voices would be uh, heard in the climate meeting. He was pleased with the commitments that were made, but still remains, a lot remains to be done. Even in the face of clear signs, some governments are still not willing to make the necessary commitments. The world over, we're already seeing the impact of our warming planet, and the impact is felt disproportionately by those who are the least responsible for it. From islanders in the South Pacific who are forced to, forced to leave their homes because of rising seawater and are then therefore becoming the world's first climate refugees, mm -hmm. to pastoralists and herders in the Sahel region of West Africa who are violently clashing over diminishing resources, to the residents of the Caribbean who are facing increased and more intense storms every year. The problem, um, the problem is already here and needs an urgent solution as we all know. So how does Antonio Guterres see the world? It's a mess. Though I think if, uh, as, he, as he has put it more eloquently, we're living in a world of disquiet, a great, where a great many people fear being trampled, thwarted, and left behind. And I think we're seeing this today. If you, read, if you look at the news, you're seeing demonstrations in parts of Asia, Latin America, Africa, all uh, started for separate reasons, but all, I think, interlinked uh, by a frustration of people who are not being listened to by their governments, who are feeling the weight of inequality. Demagogues are taking people's rights, machines are taking their jobs, traffickers their dignity, warlords their lives, and fossil fuels their future. And I think that's in large part why we're seeing people demonstrate. So at a time when we are driven in part by worsening bilateral relations between some of the world's most powerful nations, including the risk of a great fracture between the world's two largest economies by growing presence of nationalistic policies and rhetoric, there is an evolving multipolar world lacking a renewed commitment to the multilateral system. The contemporary global multilateral architecture is under threat in just about every continent. Yet there has rarely been a time when we have needed more global solutions to the problem we face today. As most do, these problems know no borders. From climate change to migration to health pandemics to global trade, member states need to arrive at collective decisions. And as we move into the 75th anniversary of the UN, this is a critical moment to renew our common project. So why do we need this project, this experiment, or as Hubert Humphrey described it, quote, a great adventure in establishing throughout the world the positive conditions for peace and progress. As we mark the 75th anniversary, we ask what is the future we want and what is the UN we need? The future we want, in my humble opinion, we already know, and I think they remain in the words, the future we want is inscribed in the words of the UN Charter. I don't think that has changed. The preamble says it. To to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to reaffirm our faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal equality of men and women, to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. So the question remains, what is the UN we need? To answer that, those of us who work in the UN will need to listen and show some humility. Over the start of the next year, as we mark the anniversary, the Secretary General will be encouraging global conversations and debates about the future of multilateralism and the kinds of institutions we need to deal with, with climate change, 
the rapidly evolving technological environment, from social media to artificial intelligence to bioengineering, and most importantly, how to deal with the growing trust gap, the lack of trust that people have in their public institutions. I have no doubt that Citizens for Global Solutions, Global Minnesota, and UNA USA will participate in these dialogues with you with enthusiasm. Dear friends, before taking some of your questions, I do want to talk a bit about the, um, something that is more relevant to you, which is the US-UN relationship. It's 75 years old, it's had its ups and downs. Um, there are many approaches to take, but what I want to focus on is on value. What is the value to the American public of the United Nations? I think while some support the UN for ideological reasons, which we welcome, Others need to be persuaded by a return on investment approach, emphasizing the value the U.S. receives in return for its contributions to the organization. Supporting the U.N.'s vast network in peacekeeping, political mediation, global health, gender, climate, refugees, and so on, basically all 17 sustainable development goals, is of course for us the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do for anyone who wants a, a world that is free of conflict, stable, and open for global trade. After all, the challenges the SDGs address transcend state boundaries and cross continents. Peacekeeping operations, UN peacekeeping operations are cost effective to prevent countries from becoming failed states with all the implication that has for the spread of terrorism or health pandemics. And a recent GA uh, study by the Government Accountability Office I think showed that a, a UN peacekeeping operation versus a US alone peacekeeping operation was eight times less expensive done by the UN. Supporting an orderly and managed migration across the globe can be a win-win for both countries of origin and countries of destination. And as, as Mark said, but I think everyone recognizes Minnesota's bright example of providing a home to those who flee violence and poverty from the world over. And I don't think anyone can give Minnesota a lesson in showing solidarity with migrants and refugees. I know you've not only welcome refugees, but I hear you've sent a former refugee to Washington. <laughs> um, managing migration will also deal a blow to criminal gangs who prey on the most vulnerable populations. Supporting our efforts to make sure that girls are treated equally and have full access to education and health care is one of the most important investments to ensure the well-being and stability of any country. On that note, I also want to report that in just about two years, uh, Antonio Guterres has now uh, rejiggered the his senior management group, which is basically his cabinet, to have a parity between men and women. That all 160 of the UN resident coordinators, who are, for lack of a better term, the UN ambassadors in the country, also are at parity 50-50. That's in less, in, in two years. And I don't think, and I, I'm likely wrong, but I don't think any country uh, can say that its uh, ambassadors are now 50-50. And this is something that has been driving the Secretary General really from day uh, one. And it's the first time, obviously, in the history of the UN that we've had this sort of parity. Supporting the science and helping countries like Tuvalu, Vanuatu, and Fiji deal with the very real and very present impact of climate change has a direct link to mitigating the impact of climate change on agriculture and dealing with billions of damages due to extreme weather right here in the U.S. At least I, I don't have to tell you about the floods that we've seen here in the, in, in the Midwest. Funding the UN's work in fighting pandemics like Ebola is perhaps the only way of ensuring that deadly diseases don't spread uncontrollably in our interconnected world with the devastating impact that it would have. As I mentioned, prevention lies at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals. Investing in the goals is about investing in the long-term stability of our world and by definition, the long-term stability of every member state in the United Nations. So let me dig, go a bit more detail about the US-UN relationship. At its core, US engagement and leadership in the United Nations is fundamental to the effectiveness of the United Nations. The US is, of course, our largest funder, so that obviously has a big impact. But I think more importantly, to me at least, the United States is a country whose founding ideals are very much reflected in the UN's own founding documents, the Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Both of these documents are infused 
with the DNA that you find in the ideals of the founding of the American experiment. Active and constructive U.S. engagement pushes us to be a better and more effective organization. But it's not only engagement by U.S. administration. We also need continued engagement from civil society organizations, such as yours. You need to remain engaged with us, and just as importantly, with your representative, to ensure that U.S. participation in the U.S. <coughs> continues unabated. Maybe it come to you as a bit of a surprise, but Secretary General actually has a very good personal relationship with the President of the United States. He's also worked in partnership, and in very good partnership, with uh, former Ambassador Nikki Haley and the current Ambassador Kelly Kraft. And that relationship has really been on keeping the U.S.-U.N. relationship alive and working in turbulent times. A good relationship does not mean that the Secretary General has convinced the U.S. to change policies on certain things, just as he's unlikely to change the, the minds of other uh, leaders on the policies they, they pursue in the UN's legislative bodies. But it also does not mean that the Secretary General has changed any of his positions, which are often at odds with Washington on climate, refugees, reproductive health, and a number of other issues. But the dialogue is never closed, and we continue to work and find points of convergence. <laughs> you all have a responsibility to also help keep that relationship not only alive, but strong. While the world may be a mess, we have a great reason to also be optimistic. There's growing engagement from civil society, from business community and youth on issues across the board, from climate change to the protection of migrants and harnessing new technologies. The Secretary General knows that your engagement, your efforts, your work, your energy is part of the solution. And the efforts of uh, UNA USA and UNA, UN, UN associations around the world or what keeps us going and what stops us from being discouraged. So as I close, I want to use uh, the words of someone else who's much, who wrote something better than anything I could have said about the need for all member states to remain engaged in the UN and the multilateral system. And I quote, Today we hear voices advocating the abandonment of the United Nations, voices advocating the withdrawal from the United Nations. They are misguided voices. They would abandon an imperfect instrument for preserving world peace because they dislike our imperfect world. But to abandon the UN or to immobilize it through crippling restrictions or failure to support it would only prove that our generation has learned little or nothing or forgotten the lessons of two world wars and apparently forgotten the tragedy of half a century of nationalism and isolationism. The heroes of the world community are not those who withdraw when difficulties ensue, but those who stand in the heat of battle, the fight for world peace through the United Nations. That's not an excerpt from a speech delivered to the General Assembly this year. Those are the words of your own um, Hubert Humphrey that he wrote and delivered in a speech in 1965. And I think they very much uh, still ring true today. And those words should redouble our collective efforts to continue to work towards the future we want and the great adventure that is the United Nations. Your turn. Yes. Uh, how does the Secretary General manage to navigate the relationship with the Trump administration. Uh, does he actually talk to the president, who apparently shows no interest in foreign affairs? Or how does it work? Carefully. <laughs> uh, no, all joking aside, he's, you know, he's Can you repeat the question, sure, please? The, sure. The, the question was, how does the Secretary General um, handle his relationship with the President of the United States? First of all, the Secretary General of the UN doesn't choose any of the 193 world leaders. So we work with all the world leaders that are in, in office. Um, I would say that what we do, and it's not just with the United States, it is with a number of world leaders. The Secretary General depersonalizes things. Right? We are not in the business of saying, we condemn this, we condemn that. We stay true to our principles. So if I'm asked a question, uh, 
like I was uh, a year ago, you know, what is your reaction to um, the withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Climate Change Agreement? I say our position yesterday is that the Paris Climate Change Agreement is a critical part of our ability to fight climate change. It's our position today, and it'll be our position tomorrow. So that leads the journalists to do a compare and contrast, right? The Secretary General of the UN is not a, a head, is not on par with any of the heads of states he deals with, right? And so his job is to also keep the long game and to make sure that in 50 years and in 100 years, the United Nations survives and is still there. And so, as I said, we find there are points of convergence. We, we, we worked with the, uh, with the Trump administrations on, on UN reform, on Ebola. The, the Secretary of Health and Human Services was in the, in the Congo not long ago on the issue of opioids. So where, where there are points of convergence, we work with them. If there are points where there is no convergence, we each have our own, uh, our own position. But um, there's always, and again, this is not just for the United States, it's in the difficult world that we live in, Antonio Guterres has to play the long game because any of, those mem any of the member states could say, I'm pulling out, right? And then what happens? The organization collapses. He would grab some headlines but it's not in the long-term interest of anyone. Yeah? So I appreciate your comments about the United Nations and the U.S. <clears throat> I've been working in public education for over 30 years, and it has been troubling to see a complete ennui, lack of interest of most young people towards the United Nations, yeah? 15 of those years in K-12 schools, 15 at the University of Minnesota. University of Minnesota, mild traction with the United Nations, events like this. Young people, it doesn't seem to resonate with them, notwithstanding your most recent spokeswoman from Sweden uh, making for great headlines. What is it that we're not doing right, in my mind, to break, we have in Minnesota academic standards, bodies such as the United Nations, we talk about them in history and social studies and government, yeah? But it doesn't seem to resonate with a lot of our young people, yeah? And my question is, why do you think that is? Um, my, my, you know, I, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not an educator. Uh, but my, my <coughs> advice, I, I think, I mean, I, I, look at, listen, I look at my own children, right? Who influences them? Other young people. So I think you will always have a group of very dedicated young activists. And you know, Greta Thunberg is one example, but there are many like her that we've seen in the climate debate. Is basically bring young people to talk to other young people, mm -hmm. right? Find, they, it, it almost needs to be peer to peer. That would, that would be my, yeah. my, my suggestion. Because you know, when I, I, I go to talk in, I'm, I'm speaking in high school today, I was up in Connecticut, uh, in Westport three days ago, I spoke to a high school there. You know, the kids that they get to listen to me are the ones, you know, it's, uh, they're already in the church, right? Um, so I think it's really about them getting, it's, it's about the peer-to-peer -peer messaging. Right. Yes, right there, back. Um, uh, what can be done to elevate the voice of indigenous peoples in the pursuit of the sustainable development goals? The... The challenge for the United Nations, as it was designed, uh, was a government, member state driven organization, uh, where it was in the world in 1945. I've had worse interruptions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. Um, where, you know, up until, I'd say, through the 70s, 80s, governments had all, all the power and were monopolizing the voices within the UN, because that's what it was like by design. What has happened over the last 15 years, and increasingly over the last few years, is the welcoming by the Secretary, by the Secretary General, often over the uh, grumblings of, of member states, 
of other voices, right, who don't feel represented. That includes indigenous, uh, indigenous people, young people, business community, I mean, a whole different side of voices. The, the indigenous um, peoples have, have, have a structure within the UN, which is the indigenous forum, and they meet, uh, they meet every year. You know, what can be done, I, I think, is speak louder. If your voice is not heard, speak louder. That's my basic, uh, that's my basic advice. But also, you have to work both through, your, through national governments but also, I think, directly through the indigenous form of structure within, within the UN. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to the back and I'll come back. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Dujoli, um, I've spent 50 years since childhood advocating for the UN, so I am 100% devotee. You mentioned toward the end of your speech this scary scenario that some people in the United States want to leave the UN abandon the UN. And as a small businessman, I deal with all of those people every day, with developers, Joe the plumbers, etc. So are we preparing ourselves? I hate to ask a foreboding question, but what if President Trump tomorrow or next month or the day after decides to pull out of the UN? Are we getting ready for that scenario? What are we gonna do? I would say to to to, to answer your question. First the um, Hubert Humphrey's quote was obviously delivered with a U.S. audience in mind, but it is true of a lot of other countries, right, where we're seeing people feeling that misunderstanding what the U.N. is doing, saying the U.N. is trying to impose refugee quota on them, the U.N. is trying to impose all things on them, the U.N. is a world government. So it applies, unfortunately, in many, 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 many countries. Um, The Secretary General has always told me, never answer a hypothetical if you want to keep your job. <laughs> uh, but I would say, we're not preparing for countries who, who may leave. What we're focusing on is ensuring that we have an organization that is relevant so they don't. Is that for diplomatic answer? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. As a former board member of Global Minnesota and the Minnesota UNA, I know very well how hard it is to raise money to do our educational and outreach work. Uh, I wish you would comment a little bit on the uh, problems that the United Nations has had in financing refugees and really things that people get very worried about. Which problems, the financial problems, the United States, the indebtedness, failure to pay dues, we could talk a little bit sure, about sure. that, and how common it is with not just the U.S., but in other countries. It's a very good question. Would you allow me if I take off my jacket? Oh, yeah. Ah, <laughs> I watched, to prepare myself for my Minnesota trip, I watched uh, Tom Harkin's uh, <laughs> eulogy of uh, Senator Wellstone. Oh, Halfway through, he took off his jacket, so I decided. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I won't go that far. Um, it, it's a very good question. So the finance, pretty simply, the financing of the UN system is based on two concepts. One, for the secretary and peacekeeping, are assessed contributions. Member states negotiate amongst themselves or who will pay what share. Those are treaty obligations, right? The vast majority of the work of the UN, especially in the humanitarian field, is all voluntarily funded. We have, we're not sitting on any cash reserves. So when there's a crisis in Yemen, a crisis in Syria, every year we have to put out a humanitarian appeal. Those appeals are chronically underfunded, unfortunately. Um, so we, our colleagues, my colleagues at UNICEF, the World Food Program, UNHCR, spend a huge amount of time, what we call resource mobilization, what you would call fundraising, right? Big numbers, because, and we've had, We've had uh, moments where WFP had to cut the food rations of Syrian refugees in Lebanon and in Turkey. And what happened, it was, I'm sure, part of the reason why we saw a sudden influx of refugees going into, Tur into, uh, into Greece. If you, if you don't have enough to eat, you're going to move. Mm -hmm. So that's a constant challenge. And it's a challenge because 
governments the world over, except for a few, have, di have a diminishing resources themselves. They're struggling to meet their own budgetary needs. So that's one challenge. On the assessed contributions, we're, we have a huge cash flow problem these days. I mean, there's a risk, the controller told me uh, that there was a risk that we wouldn't meet our December or January payrolls. Because the member states all pay at different times. And right now, we've always been used to the U.S. paying late in the calendar year because the U.S. fiscal year is January, December. The U.S. fiscal year is, I think, October to October, right? And so we just got $180 million from the U.S. last week. There's still, we still need a few more hundred millions. But, you know, at least uh, I could fly back to New York. Um, <laughs> But there are countries that, wealthier countries that are now paying later and later, or that are not paying enough. And that is becoming a crippling, uh, crippling problem. We had to put in drastic uh, uh, budget cuts, uh, cost-saving measures in the UN in the last, in the last month. Uh, on, the, on the heating, you know, uh, escalator, any, any place the Secretary General could find he could save money, we're trying to save, save money. Um, there are countries that are at the risk of falling into arrears, which we call Article 19, which means if you don't pay your dues for over two years, you lose your right to vote in the General Assembly. Brazil, Argentina are at risk. Uh, no, they, may, they may make it. I mean, it's a big embarrassment for any, any, any country. Um, so it's, it's a constant challenge. And by structure, the UN is not allowed to go to the financial markets to borrow money. So unlike governments who can borrow money, we can't borrow money. So we really work uh, on a year to year, and for the, some of the humanitarians, it's month to month. Yes, right here. Hi, my name is Tamara Hill. I'm a master's candidate at the Humphrey School. Um, the UN just pulled up a 15-year peacekeeping assignment in Haiti, um, but peace in Haiti is not kept at this point. So I'm wondering when so many regions need help with conflict, how does the UN, outside of just what the member states want, decide which regions get help to what extent and when it's time to leave or to give up on a region? I'd like to say that we never give up uh, on, on anything. Uh, on, on peacekeeping, and we'll, we'll start with peacekeeping. On, on, on peacekeeping, it's it's very structured. So a peacekeeping mission can only be deployed under a mandate and a vote from the Security Council. Right? Um, the Secretary General cannot send peacekeepers on his, uh, just on his, on his own authority. Um, there is a time where we work with the Security Council uh, on seeing like what is the exit strategy because we don't want these peacekeeping missions to be um, uh, to be there permanently. It's not good, first of all, it's expensive, but it's not good for the country because it, it sometimes prohibits it from actually developing and, and walking on its own, on, on two legs for, for use of an analogy. What we've seen in Haiti is that up until very recently, things were getting better. The, 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 the peacekeeping mission was focused on uh, training the national police, uh, on helping institutions, but <coughs> there are deep political issues with Haitian leaders themselves. There have been demonstrations which are not, uh, which are kind of linked to what we were talking about before, about people feeling, protesting against corruption, the rise in fuel prices, all these kind of everyday things that people want to, uh, want, want to have. So the mandate of the peacekeeping mission came, came to an end. Um, there are other places where we've withdrawn peacekeeping missions recently, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, because it was basically a success. It took 10 to 15 years, but basically peacekeeping missions came in to try to create a space for local political leaders and interested member states to come up with a solution to put the country back on track. We are seeing places like Mali, especially the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, South Sudan, and Central African Republic, where we're not there yet. I mean, especially in South Sudan, where you have you know, um, two leaders, uh, Salva Kiir and Rick Bashar, who have waged a war 
uh, and the people suffer. Uh, and so the peacekeeping mission is is staying there. So that's kind of how, how the peacekeeping uh, works. Haiti is, what is going on in Haiti is very concerning. Uh, but there's no discussion of sending back peacekeepers at this point. How we help in other places is if we see a humanitarian emergency, then we try to raise funds. It's on issues of development, we work in partnership with local governments. We cannot work in a country without the express accord and agreement of that country, whether it's North Korea or Nigeria. Right? And so like on North Korea, we have, we have a presence. Uh, well, Food Program and others are there. They're very limited in what they're able to do, and they try to push the envelope, but they can only work with the consent of, of the government. So it's partly you know, UN development agencies seeing things pop up on the radar and then working with governments, and then also governments coming to us and asking for them. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I just want to say it's great to have you here, and thank you very thank much you. for the work you've done with the United Nations. Uh, my question is, uh, to what extent is the United Nations preparing for the emerging challenges of an emerging multipolar world, specifically with relation to provisions powers, like say China, who are pushing a system that doesn't necessarily adhere to the same general fundamental standards of the United Nations? Well, I mean, it's, it's a bit what we're, we're talking about, is how do we prepare for the next uh, 75 years of the UN, and that's why the Secretary General is trying to have these uh, global dialogues. But I, I think, you know, the, the behavior of member states, we kind of know how to deal with, in a, in a, in a sense, it's what we've been doing. The, the bigger challenge for us is how to deal with these not what we call non-state actors who have a tremendous amount of power, social media companies, some tech companies, even foundations, right? Some foundations who have budgets that dwarf member states. And so it goes to, I think, what I, a question I was answering earlier is about the power no longer being in the hands of governments. And so what the Secretary General is doing, especially on issues related to, to the internet, is to bring together all the stakeholders, governments, tech companies, civil society, to see if we can create kind of, not a regulation, but a roadmap of good behavior on how we, we bring standards into it. And that's a way of avoiding some countries wanting to impose regulations, right? It, and it's a way of, of bringing the, the technology, I think, into, it, to put it simply to me, it's, it's a way of bringing the technology into the standards of human rights standards, right? Because a lot of the stuff that's going on with the tech companies, artificial intelligence, you know, uh, automated uh, weapons, uh, all of that, has a direct impact on a lot of things that we do, you know, on gender issues, on human rights issues, uh, on health issues. And so, where for so long the, the, the power of weapons was in the hand of governments. I mean, when we discussed disarmament, nuclear disarmament, you only had governments at the table, right? Because they held the power. You didn't need to have Boeing or Rayathon or, or you know, uh, whatever French company makes nuclear bombs in, in France, you had governments. But now it's no longer the case, and that's why the UN really has cracked itself open to bring these different people into the debate. Yes, and then we'll go for it. Obviously, Kurdistan is not a member of the UN, it's not a full state, uh, yet it would seem to me that a lot of what's happening now in Turkey and northern Syria would go against the fundamental beliefs and, and principles of, of the founding uh, charter of the United Nations. And we haven't heard very much from the, from the Secretary General or any other, any other member of the UN that I'm aware of at least about what's going on there. And that seems to me like a, yep. a gap. Uh, you are right that what is going on is an affront to the fundamental principles. Uh, of the charter of the indiscriminate killing of civilians, the targeting of civilians, the targeting of civilian infrastructure, 
We've not only seen it in northeast uh, Syria, but we've seen it throughout the Syrian conflict. We've seen it in Yemen and, and all too many places. And Secretary General has clearly come out and condemned it, uh, and, and he has. In Syria, I mean, the Syrian situation is so complex and, and complicated, and, and I, don't, I don't want to try to explain it, but what I will say, the Secretary General's focus is really twofold is one on the humanitarian part, to make sure that the UN's humanitarian workers have access to everyone who needs help in Syria. I mean, we have colleagues who are right now in the northeast of, of Syria, on the border between, on the Syrian side of the border of Turkey and Syria, who have not left. We're standing and delivering, working with an amazing uh, network of Syrian uh, and, NGOs. So we need to make sure that the parties ne do not block, though often they do, whatever aid we need to come in. Um, he also wants to make sure that the political process stays on track. We've had some successes with the agreement on the Constitutional Committee. They will have their first meeting at the end of this month, uh, 30th, 30th, very soon, in, in Geneva. It's been a long slog, so he wants to make sure that that in itself is protected. And sometimes that demands, that re requires him not to grab a daily headline to make sure that in the long term the best interest of the, all the people in Syria are served by finding a political solution. Again, I think it, it, it goes back to the answer I gave to the gentleman in the front row. It's, the Secretary General is in, under intense pressure to speak up daily on everything. You know, people want him to comment on everything. But he has to keep often the long, the, the long game versus, um, you know, headlines that day that may, that may vanish. But the, the, his principle and his position have been clear on this. Yep. With the rise of nationalism, uh, how is the UN dealing with that? Uh, it seems that the more nationalistic nations get, the less they would need UN. Indeed. Uh, the, what has been troubling the, the Secretary General is the rise in nationalistic speech, in hate speech, the return of, of words that one can't even describe as neo-Nazi, but just as Nazi speech, right? Uh, and he has, um, he has come out uh, very, very strongly on this. He has worked with religious leaders and with political leaders, but it's an uphill, it's an uphill struggle. Um, Part of the issues you raise, I think, is best countered by better educating people about, not so much about what the UN is, but what the UN is not, right? It is not a world government. It is not, you know, we don't send peacekeepers into voting booths in some country in Central Europe to force them to vote one way. Um, we are a collective of, of member states. and. and we really have to work on better educating people. And the problem is that the negative narrative about the UN is a very simple one. The positive or neutral, to get to a positive or even will settle for a neutral narrative, you have to unpack the UN and explain the complexities. And that takes time and that takes retail outreach. But for that, we also need civil society organizations like the ones we have here and the ones that exist in a lot of these countries. Sir, you had a question, you were very patient. Uh, yeah, I have uh, two things, uh, and I think they can be combined. Uh, sort of thinking about it in light of some of the things you just said. Uh, one is, you know, right now we have hundreds and thousands, maybe millions of refugees all over. With climate change, I would think there would be 10 times more so has the UN thought about giving some kind of a constitutional uh, positioning or recognition 
for stateless people that all these refugees and immigrants are becoming because no one wants to take responsibility for them. They're always considered outsiders. And so can the UN come up with a mechanism to make them inclusive? The other part is I'm so happy that we have sustainable development goals. Before that, we have millennium development goals. But accomplishing those have always had a remarkable shortcomings. And primarily, they have been uh, financial issues and so on. And I understand for sustainable goals, uh, we are, there is no comparison to what the need is in terms of finances and so on and what the problems are. So have you then thought about some other kind of ways carbon tax or international some kind of a way of creating uh, resources to be able to meet these wonderful you know, goals that it sets itself. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me be clear the UN is not in the business of taxing governments or taxing people. That's often out there on the uh, on the interweb, as they say, but it's not what we do. Um, but you, you know, joking aside, you raised, uh, let me take the questions backwards, you raised some very important issues. The sustainable development goals uh, are there as a guide, right? Um, and not just for developing countries. Uh, I mean, you know, they're aspirational goals that really everyone uh, should aspire to. And it's fascinating to me to see how they have uh, trickled down into local governments. I was in Denver uh, last year speaking at an event like this with somebody from the mayor's office in Denver, and they use sustainable goals as an agenda for their policies on homelessness and gender, and, and so it's, it's a guide. In the developing world, the problem is the financing, right? And the financing is not going to come from governments. I mean, governments do not have enough money. And so the financing will have to come in large part to the private sector. And so what we've been doing, uh, I mean, even as we as late as last week, the Secretary General met with a group of global, uh, global, it's called the Global Alliance for Sustainable Investment, which is looking at people who control um, huge numbers of assets, right? And to see how we can help them invest and how we can help the private sector um, make money, but make it money in a sustainable and an honest and just way. So it's not about corporate social responsibility, it's about business for good, in a sense. So we know that governments alone can't do it, so we're working actively with the private sector. Climate refugees is already a real, and it's already here. The problem is that um, if you look at the Convention on, on, uh, on Refugees from 1951, there's a mention of climate refugees, right? And so member states will have to come up with new legal frameworks to deal with climate refugees. It's not going to be easy, but it's something that has to be, uh, that has to be done. I mean, we're seeing, you know, and I say this in a place which has shown tremendous generosity towards refugees and, and migrants, but if you look at a, you know, at a country level, the countries that are showing the greatest solidarity are Lebanon, Kenya, uh, Uganda, so often the Bangladesh. I mean, you can imagine in Bangladesh where hundreds of thousands of people showed up in, in a month, right? And there are tensions, but they are being welcomed in a way that they're surviving and they're, they're living. And so, to help those countries, the Secretary General has done a number of trips with the President of the World Bank to make sure that the World Bank um, has financial uh, mechanisms for those uh, developing countries or middle-income countries to help deal with the influx of refugees, and notably as well in, uh, in Jordan. And you know, you look at the, the Convention on Refugees, it was created in the early 1950s to deal with European refugees in Europe, right? It, the, the, the great ideals of the Refugee Convention were not for uh, 
you know, for, for Eritreans trying to find a better life, or for Somalis. It was created for Europeans, and now more countries need to show greater solidarity. Yep. Um, I, I know that the UN you know, doesn't have enforcement, uh, uh, but, but can you just talk a little bit about international enforcement and the context for me? You know, I, I got drafted and I was paying attention and the Geneva Conventions training, you know, killing yeah. civilians is a war crime. I mean, I don't let me go off on that, but just, you know, just, just talk about uh, that that whole thing. Sure, I mean, the, the, the enforcement uh, is a member state enforcement of member states, right? It is not the Secretary General deciding to enforce. He has, if you look at the Charter, the Secretary General has almost no uh, authority, but he's, since, uh, really, since Doc Hammarskjöld, he's had a bully pulpit that has only grown, grown in size. So the enforcement are on financial issues, like I mentioned. If you don't pay your dues, you lose your voting rights, right? On the violation of peace and security, it's, um, it's resolutions of the Security Council that can enforce sanctions, and we've seen economic sanctions on, on certain countries. It is also, at some point, if giving certain countries, giving a coalition of countries, certain countries the authority to intervene militarily. We saw it in the 91 uh, uh, Iraq uh, war for the, for the liberation of Kuwait. We've seen it recently when French troops went to the Central African Republic and Mali. They acted in their national capacity under Security Council uh, resolution. Same thing for the Brits in Sierra Leone, I think, or Liberia, in Sierra Leone. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, to, um, to paraphrase George Orwell, all countries are created equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> and that's the reality. The, 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 it's the reality of the UN versus the ideals of uh, the ideal scope. Is there any serious attempt to make it more equal? I, I, unfortunately, I think you know the answer to that. Um, the, uh, the, the one focus that has been to try, if you want to look at the issue of equality, is on reform of the Security Council, right? We have a Security Council that reflects the world in, as it was in 1945. No permanent member from Africa, uh, no permanent member from Latin America. And that's a challenge to the uh, authority and uh, to the authority of the UN because a lot of countries feel, well, peacekeeping missions are only sent in Africa, and yet there's no African voice on the, on the, on the, on the it's, it's in front of the legitimacy of the UN. The problem is that. To get to Security Council reform, you need the member states to agree. And you need the five countries that have the power to agree. And they all talk about Security Council reform one way or another. The problem is that those, to put it in medieval terms, right? There, there's a group of countries that are laying siege that want to change the Security Council. They themselves are not unified, right? Because um, if you look at Africa, you would have, people have talked about South Africa, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Egypt, Senegal, possible members of the Security Council. In uh, Latin America, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Mexico, India, Pakistan, okay? Uh, would China allow the, Japan to come on the Security Council? So there are all these issues, and until there's unity, of those who are laying siege, I think those inside the council chamber can sleep well. One more yeah, question. One more. Okay, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would say something maybe you don't hear very often, but um, just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the UN back in September passed a declaration related to rare diseases. Mm -hmm. 
And when you think about, uh, I'll tell you, so uh, my name is Laura Hamid, and I represent an organization called the Columbus Children's Foundation. What we focus on is accelerating access and affordability of cures for children with genetic diseases through gene therapies. And what we often find is that these kids who are so ultra rare get overlooked by industry and by other organizations because there's no economic um, aspect to solving their problems. And the UN has such big issues and many large issues. How do you prioritize the need to solve the, the big issues for the few versus the big issues for the many? Well, you know, in, in a sense, uh, we work, the organization, Secretary General Membership, works on many issues simultaneously. The coverage of what we do is oriented towards the flashy peace and security stuff. So just because you don't hear about something doesn't mean it's not happening. The issue of how to deal with non-communicable uh, diseases has been really pushed to the forefront by the World Health Organization in the last, uh, in the last few years. Partly, um, Russia has been one of the countries really pushing for uh, issues of non-communicable uh, diseases in other member states. But we, it's such a huge system, right, that we manage to, to work on different things at different times. Obviously, the Secretary General's own time is often, as much as he wants to look at long-term issues, he's often dragged in to the daily issues. But there's so much of the work of the UN that doesn't involve the Secretary General, and that involves member states. Thank you. Please join me in thanking